anniversary tonight. So, and Ben is in New Hampshire at his sister's wedding. So you got third string tonight. <laughs> yes, indeed. And uh, Ben has been leading us through the Psalms over these many weeks. And uh, the next one that falls uh, in line, since he taught from Psalm 28 last week, I'll pick right up at Psalm 29. And it is a Psalm of David. And uh, we'll, we'll pray first, okay? Gracious Father, we thank you for this evening. What a beautiful day it was. A uh, little bit windy, but hey, we're grateful for the sunshine, the clear skies. Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy. Thank you for the health that we have. Thank you for your word and the salvation that we richly enjoy in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love, Father. Holy Spirit, thank you for your love for us. And Lord Jesus, for your death that purchased us, your love is beyond our comprehension. We thank you for the bond of the Spirit that brings us together and uh, the opportunity to gather around your word. I pray that you bless Richard tonight and Lisa and uh, our brother Ben. And uh, again, thank you. Uh, we ask that you'd open our eyes to see something from this word that would encourage us and challenge us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our dog, Bella, she's a miniature schnauzer. Um, she has a fear of thunderstorms. She can really tell when the barometric pressure changes. And so... Um, it's, the, it's also the distant thunder that spooks her. I think lately her hearing's not so well. Uh, so she doesn't hear thunder that I hear sometimes because I'll hear it and I'll look over at her and she's not bugged by it yet. But at any rate, <laughs> she scurries off to the darkest, most secure place she can. That used to be my clothes closet. And uh, she would scratch in the carpet like she was trying to create a hole to hunker down in. And I'd have to yell at her, tell her to knock it off. But... Her instincts were so powerful that she wouldn't. <laughs> I'd have to scold her again. But uh, lately, she's been going in our hallway, uh, the bathroom there, and hunkering down by the toilet against the wall in the dark. On more than one occasion, Deborah's had friends over for lunch or something, and uh, they've come back from the bathroom saying, you know, your dog's sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's thunderstorms, you see. Uh, we've had other dogs that were afraid of thunderstorms. We learned to make sure the gate was closed if they were outside in the yard and thunder. It got dark because they would go wacko and just run. <laughs> thunderstorms, they're a problem to a lot of people, but to some of us actually enjoy all the celestial fireworks, don't we? Now, Deborah, as a little girl, used to sit on the front porch with your dad and really just relish the thunderstorms that rolled through Malden back in the day. And when I was a kid, I always heard that when the sky darkened and the wind started blowing and turning up the leaves of the trees so that they were upside down, that a storm was surely on the way. I don't know, something about those big oak leaves that uh, suggested, well, this is going to be a rainstorm. But Psalm 29, I'm getting around to something here. Psalm 29 is an ode to a thunderstorm. Uh, but it's not, this psalm is not just that, this poem. The primary aim here is to move from the storm to the Lord of the storm, to the King of kings and the King of creation, to the only true sovereign God. His name, as he's revealed himself in Scripture, is Yahweh, isn't it? And so Psalm 29, for all its lyrical and poetic beauty, is really a fairly feisty argument against the claims of pagan deities, such as Baal. And it really celebrates the awesome power of the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this psalm, David kind of throws down the gauntlet to all the other pretenders, challenging some of the other religions in the ancient Near East that claimed the forces of nature were actually gods and goddesses in their own right. And so this psalm, Psalm 29, exposes those bogus, idolatrous claims 
by saying that the God of Israel is the one true living God, and He's the one who creates all of these wonders that we read about. He's the one that's greater than them all. So in a way, you could read this psalm as a rebuke to those who worship the creation instead of the Creator, because He's Lord of creation. And so Psalm 29, it, it kind of walks a fine line. It's the only New Testament, I mean Old Testament text that so explicitly identifies our God directly with what people today would call natural phenomena. Uh, the physical world and the properties of, of it and the storms and how they affect the world. But the thunder, as we read this psalm, we see the thunder is really the simply the voice of God, and the lightning is just the strike of God's voice, and the wind is the effect of speech of God that's so stunning. It breaks even the mightiest oaks the way a child might play with Play-Doh. That's how powerful God is. It treads a fine line because uh, the Bible is always very careful to distinguish between God and His creation. They don't merge the two as the pagan deities do. No, he's God, and He's Lord over all of creation. So Psalm 29 never blurs the line between creator and creation. So, but our God, Yahweh, can be seen in, in and through and by the thunderstorm, but He's never just the same thing as the storm. So the thunder, the lightning, the wind, the very power of the storm, are the very, they display the presence of God in a way that when we hear the preacher speak through the loudspeakers here, the loudspeakers aren't the preacher, but are simply uh, expressing to the audience the presence of the speaker. And so the storm um, highlights the presence of our God. And David must have been watching a storm blow in from off the Mediterranean. It made its way up through the north of Galilee and into near the Golan Heights, up, up near Mount Hermon, and down into, the, into Jerusalem itself. But God can be seen in the storm. He's not the storm. Don't, we don't confuse God with His creation. But He's seen in the storm. So let's read this particular psalm we've been talking about and discuss it. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in His temple everyone says, Glory! <laughs> the Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to His people. The Lord will bless His people with peace. So let's look at this, verses 1 and 2. It says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty ones. And what are we to give? Well, first of all, who are the mighty ones? Okay, why do you say that? angelic beings. Because Job identifies these mighty ones, same word, as referring to the angelic beings. So that's a good and proper interpretation that he means mighty ones, meaning the angelic hosts. Uh, that's not the only place that uh, the mighty ones is referred to is that way either. There's one other that uses that same text. And in that case, it does refer to the angelic host. But some would argue that it means the mighty ones of earth, the mighty potentates and, and uh, the powers uh, who are not inclined to give glory to God. They're more inclined to give glory to themselves. 
I was watching along with Deborah. We were watching the making of Cleopatra because Eric Metaxas had recommended it, hadn't he? It's a documentary. I was in the book you. At any rate, uh, in, the, in the film, it portrays Elizabeth Taylor, Cleopatra, as when Mark Antony comes and appears before her, Richard Burton, she tells him to bow. And he's an emissary of Rome. He's not about to bow. But I think she convinces him to bow. <laughs> Later, she bows to Caesar. At any rate, powerful people in this world, rulers, uh, are not inclined to bow to God. Their hearts are generally pretty proud. They feel secure in their own, uh, in their own wealth and influence. But look at that first word, give unto the Lord. Give him glory and strength. How could you give glory and strength to the Lord? You can't give, give as if it's to, to confer upon God. I can't confer upon him any strength or glory. So what's this about? The New King James says give. Other texts might say ascribe or render unto, or recognize, realize that uh, God is full of glory and strength. So affirm that. Celebrate that fact. We can't confer it, but we can celebrate it, that God is um, full of glory and strength. So I like that interpretation or that translation that would say, ascribe unto the Lord O ye mighty ones. So maybe the mighty ones on earth, maybe the mighty ones on, in heaven, maybe both. Everybody, however mighty you may think you are, ascribe. Recognize that God is the one who's full of glory and strength. Three times it says in these two verses to give or ascribe or render or recognize this about God. Three times in the New King James, give, give. Give unto the Lord the glory due to His name. And His name really represents His being. So it's a, just another poetic way of saying, uh, give glory to Him. Because the name represents the person. And then after give, 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 the next step is to worship. To worship or fall prostrate before the living God or to bow down in worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Other texts say something about, uh, is there, do your translations say something else instead of beauty of holiness? Hmm? Splendor. Others will say in the holiness, in the array of holiness. And that would refer to the priestly garments the, uh, the, the arraignment that the priests would wear in the temple ceremonial worship and see the splendor of that and give that to God who's arrayed in holiness. What is holiness? We often associate holiness with righteousness. In fact, we probably use it as a synonym for righteousness, don't we? But that's not what holiness means. If you've ever heard R.C. Sproul's great exposition of what holiness is, the holiness of God. Holiness really means otherliness, otherness, that God is utterly other than us. And there's a great mystery to that, since He is other. Uh, sure, God is righteous, but uh, when we say holiness of God, we need to recognize the splendor and mystery of His being. So, uh, worship the Lord in the, of the array of holiness or in the beauty of holiness. Give, give, give. And when we give or ascribe to the Lord all that's due Him, we can't help but worship. And so we move on here. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. Now, three times we've seen that ascribe, ascribe. And we've seen Lord, the Lord, uh, before I get to verse 3. Um, the name of God. What is the name of God? How has He revealed Himself to us? His name is Yahweh, the tetragrammaton, uh, meaning four letters. And so there are four Hebrew letters. They don't have vowels in the, in the Hebrew language, so you get these consonants with markings that indicate vowels, but we really don't know how the Hebrew ancient was pronounced. Uh, we could 
we sort of have to take an educated guess. But it's translated always Jehovah. And in our uh, Bibles, it's Lord with capital letters. Each one of them is capital. That tells you that that's the ancient Hebrew word Yahweh, which God identified himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And so it stands for Y. Uh, W-Y-H, Yehovah, we get that in uh, transliteration, or the Lord. But uh, So you see the Lord is, is mentioned in this short psalm 18 times, that word, Yahweh. And uh, now it talks about the voice of the Lord. In these short verses we see in verses 3 through 9, seven times we see the voice. And this is characteristic of beautiful Hebrew poetry. It's not rhyming like in the English language so much, but one of the features of it is repetition. Repetition. And so you've got some things that are very repetitive in this beautiful psalm. You give, first of all, Yahab in the Hebrew, or uh, the, uh, the Lord, Jehovah, 18 times. And voice, the voice of the Lord, seven times. Now, David has seen this storm roll in. Literally, we surmise that he's being inspired by this thunderstorm. He says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. And so he associates God's voice as this tremendous power. The uh, the storm, uh, so when Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon was preaching, electricity was kind of uh, still, they were learning a lot about electricity. And, and uh, he chastised those who would reduce this to just a, a physical electrical phenomenon of the storm and deny the existence of the great power behind the storm. So David is saying, this God that we worship, this God that we give glory to, is more powerful than anything you can imagine. And you can just see it in the storm. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. It's interesting how uh, thunder is associated with God. Uh, in Genesis in Genesis chapter, I mean, pardon me, Exodus. In Exodus chapter 6, we see God associated with thunder. And then in Exodus chapter 19, on Mount Sinai, you see the awesome presence of God. There is thunder, there's smoke, there's great mystery associated with that. And you know, if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 1, John gets this vision on the Isle of Patmos. And someone surprises him. In verse 12 of Revelation 1, John writes, Then I turned to see the voice, the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were like white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He sounded like a waterfall, almost. I mean, it was really amplified, and it was probably very frightening. This is interesting to me that John was very intimate with Jesus for three years probably in terms of being his uh, the one whom uh, Jesus really had deep affection for probably the youngest of the disciples the brother of James known as the son of thunder <laughs> Boanerges the sons of thunder uh, that John who knew Jesus on earth very well then he sees him in this heavenly vision and he's quite a different picture his glory is not nearly veiled as it was when he was here on earth. And so uh, John makes that description of Jesus and associating his voice, the voice of God, with many waters, just as David does here in Psalm 29. 
And of course, the voice of God is amplified over the waters. You know, when Jesus preached on Galilee, it was probably because the water served as a natural amplifier uh, so that uh, m many people could hear along the shore what he was teaching and preaching. And the God of glory thunders. And commentators look at that and, then, and they combine the idea of the God over the waters and the God of the thunders and think of the storms at sea that can be so terrifying. Now, I've been on boats and ships, but I've never been on one in the midst of a, a storm. Never been like some of those in the Navy or the Coast Guard or just for whatever reason you've been at sea and a storm would, would come up. But I'm sure it's very terrifying. Remember a few weeks ago, Stuart Fowler preached about how Jesus calmed the storm. And he used as the illustration how missionaries John and Charles Wesley had come to Georgia on, and, and they weren't even born again, but they were members of the Episcopal clergy, the Anglican clergy, graduates of Oxford. And they were over here uh, under Oglethorpe's administration for the colony of Georgia. And then the, on their way back to London, uh, they were assailed by a terrible, ferocious storm, more than once on board. And they were terrified, as we probably would be, and as Stuart tells it, um, and as we know what history says, the uh, Moravians on board were calm and peaceful. And they were these German Protestants that just trusted God, come what may, they were in his hand. And it made such a powerful impression on the Wesleys that they had to investigate further. And it wasn't long before John Wesley fell to his knees at Aldersgate Chapel there in London. His life was transformed. But a powerful witness was in the midst of the storm when the voice of God thundered on the waters and uh, his people were at rest, his people had peace. And you know, that story kind of, it goes very nicely with this psalm because if you look at the last word of this psalm, you'll see shalom, peace. Okay, I have to watch my time here very much. And, um, and so we see the voice of God no, it's none of your biz beeswax. Smartphone. <laughs> She's smart alecky, isn't she? Okay, so, so David continues to view this storm breaking and just seeing God in the storm. He's over the waters, his voice thunders, and the, he, he says the Lord is over many waters. And when you combine the two, the many waters or the oceans and the voice of God, thunder and lightning and wind, it is an awesome display of power. And so he says, the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. It's so powerful. This is our God. You know, the reason that this is an in-your-face to the pagans was because Baal, the god of Baal, was supposedly the god of lightning and thunder and the god of fertility. And, and he's always pictured in ancient caricatures of him or uh, representations of him with thunderbolts, and he's holding thunderbolts. Well, what David is saying, nah, -uh. our God is the God of the storm. God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. That was William Coper who wrote those words. They're beautiful, great poetry, a great hymn. But that's our God, and oh, worship the king has some beautiful lines in it too about chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark uh, the path of the wings of the storm. So uh, we get this idea of our awesome God over the thunderstorm and uh, revealing himself in it. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars, and the Lord... Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. Now, I think that the cedars of Lebanon was kind of an iconic phrase of the massive trees that Lebanon boasted. And um, I think some of those trees, I know some of those trees went into the building of David's temple when David made a pact with Hiram, king of Lebanon. And uh, he arranged to have a lot of that beautiful timber 
play a critical role in the building of uh, Solomon's temple. I said David, I meant Solomon. But uh, God is so strong, he can cause the wind to blow in the storm and just blow over, or with his lightning, with the fire in the sky, he can take down even a cedar of Lebanon which represent to the ancient people in Israel what maybe the redwoods or the sequoias would represent to us here in America. Have you ever been out there? Have you ever driven through a redwood? So, uh, yeah, God can take those down in a heartbeat just like a kid playing with a toy and breaking it. Our God is so powerful. And, and uh, to them, I think, maybe the cedars of Lebanon represented a very powerful force, an indomitable strength. And yet God can handle that like kid stuff. So the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. He can just blow them across the terrain if he wants to with the forces of the wind. He makes them skip like a Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. Now Syrian is another name for Hermon, Mount Hermon, which is a beautiful mountain in the north. Snow-capped mountain from which the, the, the melting snow is what feeds the Jordan River. It also feeds Galilee, too. But um, Hermon is well known in ancient Israel. It's the northernmost point in Israel, that mountain there. And so the mountains of, of Lebanon and, and Hermon are like a wild young ox. One translation says a unicorn, because it may be a young wild ox only had one horn. <laughs> I don't know. But at any rate, just thought that was an interesting thing. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. Now, what's he talking about there? I think the voice of the Lord is that which thunders. So remember, David's writing this as a response to the storm. And the fire is the lightning. And you have this, inter you hear the, you, I mean, uh, you, you see the lightning, the fire in the sky. Then you hear the thunder. And it's intermittent, and they're back and forth. And so the lightning divides the thunder. That's what he's saying. And God is just putting on a pyrotechnic display that dazzles mere mortals and puts them in great fear of this awesome God in a good way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. All right, so uh, not only does God do this with the mountains and the powerful like the cedars of Lebanon, but he does it in the in the deserted places, in the wilderness, where nothing much is going on, his storms roll through the wilderness as well. Now, certain preachers will spiritualize this and suggest that in the nobodies of the world, not only does he deal with the mighty ones like the mountains of Hermon, but those who dwell in the valleys and in the nondescript, the anonymous people, the flyover people, God also displays his power to them as well in the wilderness, in the desert. So his grace and power are displayed throughout the entire world, in the mountains as well as in the desert places. And the Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. So, so utterly uh, frightening. We already know how animals respond often to this the phenomenon of the storm, which God is behind. It kind of frightens them and it causes them to give birth, but God cares for his creation and strips the forest bare. Now, by the way, that verse 9, I don't know what your translation says, but when that Hebrew is vocalized that makes the deer give birth, it sounds like also it makes the oaks to tremble. You might even have a note if you have a Bible that has notes to it. Uh, in the margins, that uh, it very well, it makes sense with the context that God makes the oaks to tremble. It's, it makes a little more sense than it does for the hind to calve or the deer to give birth. Um, but the, the point is, the voice of the Lord is very powerful and it strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says glory. So David is seeing this massive storm come, this tsunami-like, Powerful storm. It comes all the way down to Jerusalem. 
and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and see it, and the inhabitants, those who are worshiping in the temple, see this dark and powerful cloud. They hear the lightning flash and the thunder roar, and they see God, and they say, Glory! What an awesome God we serve. Now, so to keep the ultimate focus on God, this psalm begins and ends with pairs of verses that direct us to think about Yahweh, the Lord. We saw that verses 1 and 2 open with a call to render unto Yahweh and Him alone glory. Then in concluding this psalm, verses 10 and 11 direct us to the heavenly court of Yahweh where He rules as a supreme king. You see, it says the Lord sat enthroned at the flood. And by the way, there is, a, uh, there is that um, article, the, not a flood, but the flood. So David is definitely thinking of the Noahic deluge, Noah's flood. That's what he's thinking about. That our king was back there then, and he sat enthroned in that flood. He had it under control, and boy, what it must have been like in terms of uh, physical phenomenon for the depths of the springs beneath the earth to erupt and the rain to fall. Boy, it must have been a massive storm. David says, our king sat enthroned. That storm just enthroned him. That's all it did. It gave glory to him. He was in total control. So he's talking about Noah's flood there. It's not just some generic flood or water. Uh, You see, in, in my Bible, in the New King James, it says flood with a capital F, which indicates that it was the flood. And the Lord sits as king forever. That was just one glimpse, one um, snapshot of God in his glory. And it was sitting over the, where, and what does it also tell us about this God, this God of glory? That he is a God of judgment. For he sat over the flood. And when we think of the flood, we think of God's awesome judgment. So we're reminded of that, and the the nations and the pagans and the worshipers of Baal and all these others need to be aware of that, that our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a God who will judge those who reject him. And then he finishes up, not only is he king, but he's our shepherd. He's our shepherd. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with shalom, with peace. And as we well know, that shalom does not just mean the cessation of conflict or war. It means a sense of well-being through and through. It's a sense that things are right, that things are as they should be. And it's a peace that passes understanding. And it can only come from God in our response to this one who deserves all our honor and praise. Ascribe to him glory, all you people. Look how powerful he is. So David uses those several verses, 3 through 9, to show why we should give unto the Lord the honor that's due his name. That, those verses there about the voice in the storm is he's awesome, he's worthy. And then he brings it home by saying, our God is king, and he's the shepherd of your heart. Will you give him glory? Will you respond to him? Most people do not live. I would say most Christians probably don't live their everyday lives as if our God is an awesome king. We just don't. And David is saying, do. <laughs> our God is great. And so the, that last Hebrew word is shalom. Not just peace and quiet, but a, a peace that passes all understanding. And so on a deeper, profound level, Psalm 29 calls us us it calls us it beckons us to realize that God loves us enough to want to save us by turning his strength loose in our own hearts this power that's displayed in the storm has changed our lives and instead of wreaking havoc with trees of Lebanon all strewn all over the landscape instead that storm in us has brought about a peace a driving out self and idols, and all those things that hinder our relationship with Him. His power has been unleashed in our souls, and He's brought us shalom, peace. And so that's why it, re- it really demands from us a cry of glory. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for this Psalm of David. Very creative on his part. Uh, a, really a beautiful poem that... Uh, 
displays your glory. Help us the next time it rains uh, and rains hard. Help us to hear your voice in the thunder and see your power in the lightning and praise you for it and enjoy the fact that through all the storms of life, still you bring us peace through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. Help us to remember that when we see your hand in the storm. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, does everybody have a prayer sheet that would like one? Okay, I've got 